Good morning, everyone, and welcome to day four of the Virtual Island Summit. Uh, my name is Martin Ford, and I'm today's moderator for the session focused on the Caribbean utility model and the drive towards sustainability and resiliency. Today, we will be joined by panelists from the utility sector of the Caribbean and also the Pacific. Uh, our panelists are uh, the executive director of the Caribbean Electric Utility Corporation, Dr. Cletus Burton, uh, Mr. Leroy Abraham, the General Manager of the British Virgin Islands Electricity Corporation and the Vice Chair of Carolec, uh, Mr. Andrew Daka, who's the Executive Director of the Pacific Power Association, Mr. Roger Blackman, Managing Director of Barbados Light and Power Company, and Ms. Mrs. Ruth Forbes, the president and CEO of Fortis TCI um, in the Turks and Caicos Islands. Everyone, welcome to today's session and thank you for making the time. Uh, we, for those of you on the line, you know, you can ask your questions in the chat and we will have some time dedicated at the end of the session to go through your questions and we, we, we hope to to address them um, in a timely manner, but if not, we will share those questions with the panelists after the session. So, some of you, for those of you who are not familiar with the with the Caribbean Electric Utility Services Corporation, that is the body of all the utilities in the Caribbean. And so, today we hope to share some of the challenges and successes of managing Caribbean utilities while striving to build energy sustainability and resilience in Caribbean states. The Caribbean energy sector is always developing strategies aimed at reliability, affordability, sustainability, and also aligning with governments to meet the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. So we're faced with many hurdles in the Caribbean, and we tend to have to take a multi-sector approach, especially given the recent pandemic and the plethora of natural disasters that we face. We face earthquakes, um, hurricanes, uh, many, many, many of the, the challenges facing us today um, and across the ocean in the, in the Pacific. So to start the session, um, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Burton uh, to, to explain a bit about what resilience means for Carolec. Introduce Carolec and explain a bit about what resiliency, resiliency means for us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. And uh, You're welcome. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, good morning to my colleague panelists. Uh, good morning to participants, attendees. Um, we thank uh, the organizers for this uh, opportunity to discuss very pertinent and relevant issues concerning to uh, the development uh, priorities for the region. Uh, Carolec is an association of uh, energy service providers in the region, um, has been in existence for just about 31 years now. We celebrated our 30th anniversary in 2019. And as an association of electric utilities, plus other critical partners in the sector, our role really much has to do with capacity building, providing business development opportunities for our members, networking, uh, knowledge transfer, advocacy, and uh, very importantly, coordinating a disaster assistance program, among other mutual assistance initiatives. Uh, the essence of the association is based on uh, collaboration, uh, solidarity, recognizing our vulnerabilities in this part of the world, and uh, coming together as the uh, Kenyan proverb says, uh, sticks in a bundle are not easily broken. So we recognize that alone, uh, we would uh, face a very difficult time uh, surmounting some of the challenges and unified and having a coordinated approach is always more useful in that regard. Uh, Karelek, I should say, undertook a major repositioning uh, leading up to our 30th anniversary in 2019, we recognized that the, obviously the market was changing, technology was changing, uh, energy transition was a thing that was very much, is very much with us. And so the organization undertook a, 
a deep dive into its structure, into its processes, into its strategy. And we basically revamped our vision statement, our mission statement, and expanded the tent, so to speak. And which is why now we call ourselves an association of electric energy solution providers, uh, in addition to being an association of electric utilities in the region across four languages, English, French, Dutch, and one or two Spanish speaking utilities as well. So we do have a membership category for independent power producers. Um, we have seven uh, companies registered in that category. And leading up to our EGM, which will be on September 23rd, uh, we will see for the first time a director representing IPPs on the board of Carilec uh, when the IPP, IPP grouping or membership category caucuses uh, prior to the AGM on September 23rd. So we're very um, happy that um, there's been very good response to this uh, repositioning. And our flagship program, which as I mentioned is the disaster assistance program, is based on an excellent mutual assistance spirit um, among our members. 27 of our members uh, participate in the disaster assistance program, whereby they contribute to a fund on an annual basis, in addition to their membership subscription. So it shows great commitment and the perception of value in this service that is offered. And if any of these 27 member utilities are struck with a disaster, then the secretariat is tasked with coordinating the response effort. And so the affected utility would not have the cost at that most inopportune time of uh, funding the inflow of uh, supplemental support um, for the uh, disaster restoration effort. So that is coordinated by the Secretariat uh, in coordination with the assisting utilities, who I must say also bear the cost uh, of the labor wages and overtime associated with the deployed line workers and technicians and engineers. So that's at no cost to the uh, receiving utility and the, the expenses associated with travel, logistics, um, allowances per diem is also met from the fund that would have been established over a period of time. So, uh, and I must say in closing, as I just round up this overview, um, this year, uh, as we all know, is, is no ordinary, ordinary year. Um, 2020 has been fraught with numerous challenges. And as Martin uh, mentioned in his introduction, mm -hmm. Uh, we are adopting a mutual, a multi-sectoral response to a multi-hazard environment. And what that means is that Carilec has been taking the lead in coordinating with industry partners, uh, namely in telecoms, the Canto, there's the Caribbean Association of National Telecoms Operators, uh, with Kawasa, the Caribbean Association of uh, Water and Sewage uh, Utilities, and also with the emergency, Regional Re Re Emergency Disaster Response Agency, CDMA, and the public health agency, CARTA, uh, all in an effort to better coordinate our regional response mechanisms and protocols uh, to the multi-hazard environment, namely, uh, obviously, tropical cyclones and COVID-19. And we've had numerous uh, quite uh, instructive engagements, uh, virtual summits, where we have streamlined our joint response protocols uh, to disasters, uh, given the, the uh, COVID-19 that's still with us. So that's just a quick overview of the association. And I trust that as the discussions uh, go along that we will have a fruitful exchange of ideas and information. Um, so over to you, Martin. Um, thank you for the time. Thank you, Dr. Burton. And really appreciate your overview. And you know, you, you, you said something there that utilities have to have a multi-sector approach. For the context of those who may not be from islands, many of our islands have one utility for the entire island so we do play a critical role and um you know that's why i'm excited to actually um introduce uh mr leroy abram from from bvi uh because of earlier in the year we we talked a bit about their experience you know being the utility and experiencing um a disaster uh in their past and now um so, Mr. Abraham, could you tell us what the share, the body, the Carolec body of knowledge does for your utility, and what does resilience look 
for look like for you given the disasters that you've faced and 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 are trying to avoid so hi good morning good morning martin good morning everyone i'd like to recognize the protocol having already been established by dr burden uh resilience um we had a conversation on this martin a couple couple months ago um definitely for the caribbean region every, every island is different um geographically topographically um they have a different topography so every island is particularly different so there's no silver bullet with regards to the uh, particular solution which is um which is going to address the issue with regards to um resilience for every particular island for BVI, for the British Virgin Islands, what we see is a diversified portfolio of assets and services, which encompass um, um, T and D hardening, um, undergrounding, um, incorporating renewable energy sources and penetrations at different areas of our grid. Um, one of the challenges with the British Virgin Islands is that the um, the single utility, as you've mentioned, which supplies most of these islands, we supply twelve different islands from one from one main island. So our grid, albeit that the islands are somewhat relatively small in comparison to others, it is quite an expansive grid that, um, that crosses over, over water. Um, so incorporating renewable energy assets throughout, the, um, throughout our expansive grid, uh, capacity building and, um, and, and, and reskilling um, for both utility workers and the and persons in the industry. And one of the key things which we've recognized based on our experiences from 2017 is that we have to strengthen our alliances with uh, various stakeholders in our, and our industry partners. So with the combined, with these combined assets and, and services, we feel that that will be the perfect solution for us with regards to building greater resilience for, um, for our utility. Well, I mean, you, you, you made a great point just now about the, about the importance of partnerships. Um, you know, we, we are facing a looming global recession uh, it, because of COVID-19. So how, how, ha, how has that affect, has COVID-19 affected your role in operations uh, in BVI? The, the current pa pandemic has definitely created to some degree, I would say, um, and equally so or even greater disruption to the electric utility business. Um, first of all, we've seen a significant reduction in terms of um, low demand due to the industries which have been um, significantly impacted as a result of this pandemic. Um, most, of the, most of the Caribbean region, one of the primary means of revenue for most of these countries is tourism. Um, and that industry has come to a grinding halt as a result of this, um, as a result of this pandemic. So we've seen a significant reduction in low demand um, due to the unemployment associated with those industries which have been um, severely impacted, um, hospitality, tourism. You have quite a number of individuals who are unemployed but unfortunately still utilizing um, electricity because electricity is the lifeblood of the economy is a essential service and necessity for life. Um, so that has now impacted the economics with regards to the business as well. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's somewhat of a struggle um, and recognizing that there's no particular playbook because this is all new to all of us. It's going to take, um, 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 it's going to be quite a challenge with regards to navigating through this particular situation with a um, extreme weather event. Um, you know that things are going to be knocked down and ultimately it's just to get the resources to put it back up and then you're back in business. With this particular disruption, everything is still in, in, is still in place. Your T&D infrastructure your utility is still in place, but ultimately you're going through some of the same effects as, a, as, as regards to, a, a, as I said, a extreme weather event. You, you have a significant load, um, um, you have a significant reduction in load demand. You have customers who have, or unfortunately are unable to pay their bills. So it's somewhat of a challenging situation to navigate through. And, um, and as we can see, COVID is something that will not be, will not be going away anytime soon. So ultimately, we have to 
come up with some very um with some very um robust solutions to for dealing with this for the long term yes yes um i agree i mean i remember when we did our panel back um in june and and one of the other panelists uh mentioned uh, the way she framed it was that covid is a long lasting <laughs> hurricane, right? Um, um, she was speaking from a banking perspective. But you know, like, it definitely, from what I understand, it has changed kind of, not just, you know, utilities, but everyone and in terms of their approach to investments. Um, with the theme of resilience, wh what role does renewable energy and green investments play for um, for your utility at this point? It plays a, the, I would say a dual role. Um, the role of um, sustainability with regards to utilizing the indigenous or natural resources of the, of the territory to provide energy. Um, it also provides that resilience, recognizing the extreme weather event that we that we, um, that we suffered from in 2017, which unfortunately took power out for an extended period of time. It took us um, six months to restore the grid and restore all the customers back to, um, back to the, the grid um, as the grid was significantly affected. Uh, approximately 90% of the grid was wiped out from Hurricane Irma. So renewables does play its part. Um, in terms of that blended mix as we're trying to achieve in the British Virgin Islands of a well-diversified portfolio of generation assets with traditional power that's complemented by, by RE. Um, so therefore, with regards to this single source of energy production, at the end of the day, you have a well-diversified portfolio such that you have assets. And as I said, we have quite an extensive um, electricity grid. So therefore, with having having eleven islands also supplied from the one main island in the in the territory, having these RE assets spread over very, all these different jurisdictions provides the utility provides BVIEC with a much better um, opportunity with regards to recover as quickly as possible from um, an extreme weather event or even this current dis disruption with regards to mitigating because one of our primary concerns, believe it or not. Um, in the very infancy of this pandemic, um, recognizing the closure of all the various international borders, were the one of the very first calls we made was to our fuel supplier. Would you be able to deliver fuel to us? So it is a real, um, it, it, it is a real or possibly real situation, whereby um, the energy that we get that's that's imported via fossil fuel, there might come a possibility that. Unfortunately, there might be some disruption with regards to the availability of that product um, um, being delivered to our various jurisdictions. And with that, we need to be able to ensure that we have a sustainable, um, sustainable energy supply utilizing natural resources that we, that we have regionally. Well, I mean, just how you framed it there for the audience that is not familiar with the electricity field it's an issue of national security, um, no doubt. Uh, having so, so you know, in the utility space, when I when I first started getting into the field, uh, you would hear a lot about reliability, and now this is distinguishing, I guess, between reliability and resilience, and and that reliability is a part of resilience, but there are other aspects um, as well. Um, but thank you very much, uh, Mr. Abraham. Uh, right now, I would like to to turn to uh, Mrs. Ruth Forbes, who is the president and CEO of, of Fortis TCI, the Turks and Caicos Islands. Uh, thank you for joining us, Ruth. Welcome. <laughs> thank you, Martin. Um, so, you know, you, you come from another jurisdiction with multiple islands. Um, could you share what resilience looks like for Fortis TCI? Good morning. Thank you again, Martin. You're very welcome. So, um, for, for us, resilience has been 
um, embedded through, throughout our operations at, at Fortis DCI. And we look at resilience from a system delivery as well as a re reliability perspective. You know, our system being able to withstand external shocks, um, the, the hardening and, and the diversification of field and plant assets um, is also um, high on our list for resiliency. Um, we do have um, operate multiple um, plants for, for independent power plant and, and serve another um, one of the islands through underground cable. So, um, you know, assets um, uh, are very important there. Resiliency also to us is um, being nimble in our approach, ensuring that, you know, whatever um, circumstances we face, we, we are able to, to approach them rapidly, rapid recovery, getting services um, restored as quickly as possible. Um, in 2017, we, 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 um, we had the, 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 the task of restoring um, power after Hurricane Irma, and we were able to do that um, within 60 days. So rapid recovery as well is, is a part of our resilience strategy. Adaptability is also important for us with resiliency, being able to incorporate our lessons learned from the past. And um, we, we had several of those um, coming out of Irma. Also for us, um, financial resiliency um, is one of our uh, business continuity strategies as well, um, ensuring that we have a, a, a strong balance sheet to withstand um, the economic and fiscal shocks. Um, and, and a part of that, of course, includes our, our access to capital markets as well. Um, also equally important, uh, how we look at resiliency is also the part, different partnerships and stakeholder strategies that we um, use to serve our communities. Um, and last but not least, a, a final, uh, an important aspect of resiliency is also resourcefulness, having um, um, the ability to how you skillfully manage a crisis as it unfolds, having a highly skilled and committed um, workforce. Um, that, that is also a very vital part of our, our drive to, towards um, resiliency. Um, we can't do what we do without, you know, having the, the right people and people who are empowered and, and result, being resourceful in their roles. So that's a, an overview of what resiliency uh, means to us at Fortis DCI. Well, thank you very much. You know, you, you mentioned, you know, uh, last but not least, the people and the importance of people. And, you know, I, I just have to let it be known that, you know, like Fortis DCI has always been open to sharing um, with the other Carolite utilities and, and, and showcasing their, their people. Um, do, do you, how do you see the Carolite body of knowledge being useful for other persons around, around the world, um, not just in the region, but around the world? Well, we've had a um, great experience with Carolac. Um, it, it's truly a, a wealth of knowledge and, and resource um, in the region. It has been that for, for many years. Um, it's been very useful and, and stimulating um, conversations on how we, we can individually and collectively as, as Caribbean nations advance the, the energy sector how we can diversify our portfolio and, and you'll get back at doing, doing the things for our respective islands. So, so Carolac has, has been a, a strong um, source of support for our utility um, um, from the regional participation in the regional conferences, the international events, and um, Dr. Burton mentioned um, the, strategy, the overall strategy with COVID. Um, and just, just having that, um, that, that body to, to rely on to provide um, support um, um, in times like these. Um, so so Carolac has, has been a real um, partner um, for us here and, you know, help us to provide different solutions and, and new ideas um, and sessions just like this. So Carolac, um, Carolac comes highly recommended. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what is, uh, what is, uh, build, I know we hear the term building back better. What, what does building back better really mean for your team um, at, at Portis? Well, um, building back better, um, you know, notwithstanding we, you know, the financial hit that we are all taking as a result of this pandemic, um, we, we, we must um, find ways to emerge from this with our fundamentals intact. Um, having a sound financial footing, of course, in, in the short and the long term 
taking care of our employees, ensuring that they remain um, the heart of the company, and also continue to, to provide um, our customers with the best possible solutions. Um, this pandemic presented um, um, opportunities as well. Um, certain behaviors were, were, were learned um, during the pandemic. For us, we, we were able to, we had to um, remotely um, serve all of our customers. That wasn't the case before the pandemic, remote, remotely and virtually. So now all of our customers are being um, served um, externally. So there lies an opportunity. So building back better for us um, means also taking a keen look at the opportunities that, that um, is coming out of this pandemic or any external, any um, events um, that happens to the organization and just really learning from the lessons um, learned. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Forbes. Um, really appreciate you joining us and your perspective. And, you know, we talk about building back better. So, so I'm going to turn to Mr. Roger Blackman, um, who's Managing Director at the Barbados Light and Power Now, to speak a bit about, about that aspect. Um, well, speak about resilience, but also um, the role of uh, renewable energy um, in that building back process because uh, for context for those of you joining um, I believe Barbados has a goal of 100% renewable energy by 2030 and you know there, there are different opinions on how re how realistic that can be um, but nevertheless there's a goal and in this instance, the utilities on board to to meet that goal as well, separate from the the government or in alignment, I should say, with the government. So, Mr. Blackman, um, could you speak a bit about what resilience means for Barbados Light and Power and the role of of renewable energy and dis dis distributed energy resources in that plan to meet your goal? George, thank you and good morning, Martin. Good morning to fellow panelists and, and all those who are, are logged on. Um, all protocols haven't been observed. Uh, maybe what I'll do, Martin, is just give a, a brief overview, start on the, the aspirations around renewables and then end with the uh, maybe comments around the, the, the contribution to resilience. Here on the island, um, we, we are a vertically integrated utility, as Martin indicated, quite, uh, is quite common on, on the islands in the Caribbean. Um, the Barbados grid, is just under um, a thousand gigawatt hours with a peak demand of about 170 megawatts. Um, we currently have about 50 megawatts of solar installed, um, uh, 10 megawatts owned by the utility and 40 megawatts are, that are customer owned. Um, so we're, we're on the way, I guess you could say, and, and solar is playing uh, the, the major role in terms of the transition at the moment. Uh, and it accounts for about 8% of the energy um, and about 25% of our peak demand on a sunny day. Uh, the remaining 92%, of course, it remains um, from conventional sources, uh, fossil fuel sources, gas turbines, uh, diesel engines. Uh, as the, the Martin had indicated, we, we play, you know, the utility clearly has an integral role to play in the transition, both as a generator as well as a purchaser of renewable energy and operator of the grid, of course. And, and we have you know, been committed to the transition for quite some time, as Martin indicated, we are in alignment with government. And um, <clears throat> there are lots of debates and discussions about the path to get there, um, but the, the, we are on that, that road to uh, transition into a carbon neutral economy over the next decade. The um, things that we've been doing already over the last few years, we would have installed utility scale solar. We, we've installed a few years ago, um, utility scale storage. Uh, we introduced a feed-in tariff program about 10 years ago. That accounts for the, the 40 megawatts that I mentioned already. It's about 2,500 or just over 2,500 customers that um, are tied into the grid uh, at the moment and supplying PV power. We've been an early EV adopter. We have quite a large EV fleet, um, starting about seven years ago with the first one that we, we brought in. Um, we use biodiesel in our trucks. Um, so we started that again, maybe about seven or eight years ago. Uh, we've been investing heavily in grid modernization. So uh, starting with smart meters is a, a sort of foundation investment. And by the end of this year, all of our, we, we have complete advanced metering infrastructure and conversion to smart meters. Um, 
the the government recently here recently published an energy policy with a very ambitious target 100% renewables by 2030 um, and it, it is made up you can find that policy incidentally online um, you can google it uh, Barbados National Energy Policy and there's also an implementation plan that goes along with it looking at the first five years um, essentially it, it, it is dominated by solar um, and uh, to lesser extent some wind uh, in the order of 600 megawatts of solar and wind, uh, about a small amount of biomass and waste energy providing firm renewables, and about 200 megawatts of battery storage. Um, our internal assessment at the utility is that the, the, there will be a need for significantly more battery storage, um, and there will be a need for firm renewables to, to, to reduce ultimately the amount of storage that will be required because you know, when you're, you're dependent on, on intermittent renewables. And so we, we, we believe you know, maybe double what is in the current policy would be required for storage. Um, and uh, we don't have, unlike some of our neighboring islands, geothermal or hydro resources. Uh, and so for firm renewables, um, we would be reliant on uh, biomass or waste energy of some sort. And that certainly is in the, the, the plans for the future. Uh, and another key, uh, item that we've, you know, in our assessments, we realize we require is there's quite a bit of work on the grid um, as the, the infrastructure changes uh, and the model changes to, to, from central generation to one in which the distributed generation plays, plays a big part. And synchronous condensers, which are, you know, essentially um, you know, DC excited motors that, that um, are not connected to anything to provide stability in terms of. Uh, inertia on the network that is lost as we lose rotating equipment um, and short circuit power uh, to, to provide stability on the network um, as intermittent renewables come on and don't provide that on their own. So there's you know around 80 megawatts or so or, or so we see of um, synchronous condensers required as well to provide that stability as the penetration of intermittent renewable increases. And the the key for us when we question about whether it's achievable or not, we, we think, you know, it is achievable. Um, it is very ambitious to do it in such a short time line. There's no, no doubt about that. Um, but there are some key enablers that we've identified that would be required um, to, to be successful. One is the licensing framework. Um, and we are working, you know, the, the, the environment and the market needs to be structured in a way for, uh, to, to, to allow it to be successful. Um, and uh, quite often, you know, people may, may look at um, restructured markets in North America or Europe, and those don't, those don't work in very small markets like ours. So there's a lot of um, uh, customization, I guess, and um, you know, designing something that is right for, for the island environment. As Leroy would have mentioned earlier, even within the, between the islands, there are significant differences in what works on one may not work on another. The other is a regulatory framework, the way the sector is regulated, um, you know, traditional um, regulatory approach, and, you know, long drawn out rate cases you know, at significant cost. Um, that needs to be, you know, there need to be adjustments um, there uh, given the, the nature, uh, I guess, uncertainty in planning and the nature of the transition and the speed with which we are aiming to do the transition here, there are adjustments required there. Planning permissions on, on some of the islands, uh, and we are no exception, can sometimes be a challenge, the length of time it takes, and those, those are areas that need to be looked at as well um, uh, to, to facilitate um, the, the, the transition and uh, the grid design. Uh, and I think a phased approach is important as well, trying to do too much too quickly. You lose the opportunity of technological um, advances. Um, and, and cost benefits from for that will occur over time as technology improves. Um, so maybe I'll pause there before touching on, on resilience because I feel like that was a bit of a mouthful um, argument. But I can talk a little bit about how we are thinking about resilience as well. Well, I mean, I mean, you know, to synthesize what you're saying, you know, like you, the the market is constantly evolving, it's constantly changing, and the utility plays a critical role. But you also mentioned, you know. The, the role of the regulator in establishing the framework um, to make sure that that there's fairness and equity across you know the customers um, and also the utility uh, but but there's no doubt in my mind you know being from Barbados too I have a bit of context but <laughs> but like there's no doubt that you know distributed energy resources and and 
re residential systems play a huge impact because last time I was home, I was speaking um, with one of the engineers and he, he highlighted that we have a very high, um, I think, r solar energy per capita rate in the region. Um, and a lot of that, you know, from con for context for the audience, uh, that came from in back in 2009, I think it was when you when Barbados Land Power had the renewable energy writer to test these systems, um, which is breaking with the narrative that you might see um, that the utility is anti renewables. And now you're seeing it's, it's just a beautiful thing for me to see the shift to uh, where the utility is taking the lead and setting up the framework for that alongside um, working in partnership with the government and all the stakeholders yeah 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 and and i know you you have uh emphasis now on community solar um could you speak a bit about the importance of that for for barbados light and power well this distributed solar so the distributed solar and 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 centralized solar facilities will, will sort of complement each other going forward um, and um like i mentioned all the land share of the, of the soil is installed now is distributed and customer owned. Um, community models are being um, developed. Uh, there's a, a, a new cooperative society uh, that's been recently set up on the island um, that um, is, is, is charged with um, one of its objectives is to, uh, I guess, facilitate um, investment by the, the average Barbadian in the growth of the renewable sector. And so those you know, community models are springing up as, 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 a, as a result of those types of initiatives. Um, distributed energy, of course, you know, having that mix of distributed and, and centralized and renewables uh, does provide some uh, resilience benefit. Um, and, you know, we haven't spoken about things like microgrids and so on, but having some of your generation resources spread on the network does provide, um, if, if designed appropriately, uh, does provide some level of, of resilience as well for the for the grid. Hmm. Well, thank you very much, um, um, Roger. Uh, I'm going to turn to to Mr. Andrew Daka, um, who's the executive director of the Pacific Power Association. And um, Andrew, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you, Martin. Yeah. So, so for for context, could you could you um, share a bit about the importance of for the PPA of sharing and working in collaboration with Carolac and the Caribbean? Uh, thank you, Martin, and firstly, thank you to the organizers and Carolac uh, for the invitation to be part of this discussion. Um, Dr. Bertin, in his, in his earlier uh, introduction, outlined some of the the the, the, the rationale for for Carlec, uh, Carlec's existence, which is pretty much the same as what uh, the, the Pacific Power Association is. It is like the Carlec in the Pacific, uh, with with the same uh, similar with similar functions that. Um, that brings together the, all the electric utilities in the Pacific region uh, who have similar issues and similar challenges. So, in in terms of uh, collaboration with the with the with with the Carilac, the Pacific Power Station has had a long-standing relationship with the Carilac uh, in terms of information sharing and uh, and exchange of. Of information and knowledge between the two two organizations, especially at the secretariat level, but also within the membership. Um, so, in, in one of one of the, the things that we we do note, and one one of the things that we, the Pacific can take from uh, from this uh, collaboration with Carlec is that uh, we we have much to learn from in terms of. Uh, Moving, moving towards, uh, moving into the the now uh, you know changing uh, electricity supply industry and and I think uh, the current lake has, has is a, is a, 
is a little bit ahead of the Pacific in terms of, of, of where it's operating now, but uh, we kind of, uh, we see what's happening in, in the, within the Karlik and then that's where sort of we, we are also heading, not only in terms of uh, the utility, one of the, th the only, I think the only difference I see is that in, in terms of membership, uh, Cadillac's members are, are more uh, investor-owned uh, utility, whereas in the Pacific, most of the utilities that are members of the Pacific Power Association are government or utilities, which I think can be a challenge in trying to 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 uh, uh, pro progress uh, towards uh, a viable utility. So I think that's that's where we we can learn a lot from from the Cardiac in terms of a utility model, what what works and what will not work. Uh, uh, but noting that uh, Ro Ro Roger had men mentioned that, uh, um, I mean one 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 utility model might not work for everyone, but at least we we know what what's working in in, in certain certain areas. But maybe you know customize it so that it suits your different uh, situation. And uh, okay. uh, also uh, also in, in, in regards to uh, work in, in the utility, there is a, a recognized need within the Pacific that uh, <clears throat> there is probably a need to look at uh, different utility models for the Pacific. Because uh, if we want to achieve a lot of the no, the, the national determinant contribution determined by the government. We need to look relook at our utility model so that it can be it can be able to 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 work with with the government and also private sector to achieve the the targets that have been set by the by the national government. Well, Vinica, Andrew, thank you for <laughs> for uh, for for sharing that context. Mm. Um, what you know, this has been a big year for the Caribbean, and I'm sure it's the same for the Pacific. But how has uh, COVID-19 changed, in, impacted your membership and, you know, the, the, the way that you're planning to approach the electricity sector to adapt? In, in terms of impact, uh, I think uh, it, it, it varies from country to country. Uh, depending on what uh, you know, whether the main main business areas lie, the most impact has been seen in in the countries where depend that depend on uh, tourism and hospitality for the main for the main industry. These are islands like Cook Islands, uh, Fiji, uh, Samoa, but those that uh, have little industry in terms of uh, tourism and hospitality, there is. There is very little impact at all in those countries. I think the only other impact on, on the utilities is in terms of uh, work work that's uh, had to be held up because of the travel restrictions within the islands. So, in in, in general, the impact depends uh, varies from island to island and country to country. So well, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, to those of you on the line, Andrew is the real champion today because it is post midnight <laughs> uh, in Fiji where he is. So I, I want to say thank you and Vinaka to you, Vinaka. Yeah, yeah, Vinaka <laughs> yeah. 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 um, Right now we're going to ask the panelists to all turn on their video because we're 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 going to enter the Q and A segment. Um, we have a lot of questions coming in and you know we want to to make sure that we can address some of them uh, so we had we had a lot of questions with regards to to the role of of uh, renewable energy um, and distributed um, how how I, I guess I'll open this up to to you is like how do we move from here collectively um is there a method for us to besides learning from each other um, um are there opportunities for say joint procurement of infrastructure given the disaster uh 
do you see that as an option? Has it been tried before uh, as, as Caribbean islands? Uh, Martin, let me take a first, first stab at, at that. Um, certainly what, what we're exploring, um, recognizing the events of 2017, which, um, which not only created a, a, a large amount of, of destruction to the T&D infrastructure, it also um, did quite a bit of um, structural uh, destruction to a lot of homes and, and businesses as well. So in addition to the current pandemic that the BVI is going through, we're also, also um, simultaneously going through our recovery from that event of three years ago. Um, recognizing that we're trying to employ as much public partner, um, partnerships with regards to our, both our recovery and likewise trying to get through this, this current um, COVID pandemic. Um, in some instances, we're, we're, we're working with, with various local stakeholders with regards to that partnership. In other instances, we're, we're relying on, um, on industry partners that we have to gain access to various um, grant funds for the sake of, um, of promoting and progressing our, our strategic objectives with regards to the, the, the integration of, of, of renewables as part of our strategic plans going forward for the sake of um, sustainability, energy security, and resilience. Um, so certainly, as, as I keep reiterating, there's no one perfect solution for every particular jurisdiction, but certainly we're trying to employ as many options as possible with regards to achieving our strategic objectives going forward. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess, Do uh, Dr. Burton, uh, could you, could you share a bit about your vision about collaboration? Um, I know Andrew spoke a bit about, you know, the importance of the Pacific and um, collaborating with the Carolac, but, but what, what do you see as the benefits of this collective approach? Yeah, well, uh, as I said in the introductory comments, the essence of Carolac as an association is based on collaboration. Um, being, uh, for the most part, small island developing states uh, in the region um, faced with particular vulnerabilities uh, that uh, other regions of the world could identify with in terms of the Pacific, uh, Africa, off the coast of India and so on. Obviously, the SIDS uh, related development issues are not unique to the Caribbean and I'm sure collaboration would be very foundational for many of those islands working collectively, collaboratively, um, building synergies, economies of scale, knowledge transfer and expertise, learning from each other, not repeating uh, mistakes made. Uh, so all of these are very essential in terms of uh, accelerating our development and what many say are the prospects for leapfrogging uh, using technological advances. And again, as I mentioned earlier, having a broad approach to that collaboration, being cross-sectoral, and also another aspect that we have been focusing on, and I, I see it at play in companies such as Fortis TCI, is a multi-layered approach where emphasis is play, placed at the individual employee level, just as much as the organizational level, also paying attention to the community, uh, because resilience is a really a multi-faceted, multi-layered concept. And so, for example, one can't expect the utility alone to carry the uh, champion call for resilience if we don't have, for example, building codes um, be, being adhered to in the construction sector. Um, and we don't have employees who themselves uh, take precautionary measures uh, to build their own resilience and capacity to withstand uh, disasters and hazards of many kinds. So a multi-layered approach is also something that we need to do collaboratively uh, across the sector and between other sectors. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Burden, thank you. And, and you know, it, it just made me make a connection to what Leroy was saying about facing the challenges. Um, also what you're saying about the people and the process. Um, and also yesterday's panel that, that uh, I think Jean-Michel Parle was talking about the integrated resource uh, resiliency planning. So, so for those online, there's the planning phase, there's the process, um, but also what Leroy mentioned about battling and building back 
and and Roger, you mentioned it's all about phases. So sometimes we separate disaster recovery from investment, and now we're seeing the synergy of doing it at the same time in a phased way. And we had some questions come in. So uh, what, like in terms of of that infrastructure, so what role does undergrounding of uh, of uh, utility lines and distribution networks and play um, and other resilience measures as you still make the investments uh, but in a phased approach. Uh, that what role does does that play in in your planning, given what you've seen the last few years? Hey Martin, maybe I could take a stab at, at that one. And just just before answering that directly on the earlier question. Um, and the, the issue of phased approaches. Um, you know, one, one common practice would be integrated resource planning where the utilities um, you know, engage with stakeholders and look at a, a, a number of factors and criteria in coming up with a plan for expansion um, as well as energy efficiency and demand response and things of that sort. Uh, stakeholder uh, consultation being a key part of that. Um, and so that, that um, in, in recent times, that IRP is evolving in many jurisdictions to you know, introduce a new R of resilience. Um, but, you know, I know that's what we're talking about today. So there are IRRPs um, currently being done in order. The, the government here is doing currently doing one, uh, and that's in progress at the moment. And um, that's looking. You know, traditionally utilities would look at reliability, lossable probability, or reserve margins of some sort, or contingency planning and minus two. Uh, but the resilience now is playing a, a key role um, in, in that process. Uh, and that's looking at the, at the black sky type, the, the one-off events and the ability to bounce back, the ability to take a punch type of thing as opposed to the traditional reliability um, focus. Uh, so th that's, that's how planning has evolved and what we're see, seeing happening. Um, it, on the, the subject of undergrounding, um, that's one part uh, of you know, many measures that utilities have been taking to improve their resilience. Um, and again, you know, there's a, a cost benefit analysis that goes along with that. So uh, there's undergrounding and there's indooring. Putting some of your infrastructure underground um, does carry a significant cost. Um, however, uh, when there are major events, uh, whether events uh, you are protected um, but you know, from with having those resources on the ground. But again, the, the point of being you know island specific or or the geography being important because some territories the damage they get is from flooding. And if you have your infrastructure on the ground, you may be susceptible to things like storm surge and and so on um, in a way that overhead infrastructure may not be. So every weather event isn't the same. Every territory isn't the same. And so the the measures that are taken um, will vary depending on specific circumstances. Earthquakes are more of a risk in, in some places than they are in others. And again, that will have a different impact on underground infrastructure as, as well. Just, just sharing some of the things that we, we have done. We have under, basically undergrounded um, most of our transmission network on, on the island here. Um, the distribution remains largely overhead, except in some new developments where developers pay to put it on the ground as part of enhancing property values and so on. We have more or less endured all of our substations, with the exception of one still to be done and that's scheduled in the next couple of years. Um, so that looks after the backbone of the, of the, of the network. Um, and from a cost benefit analysis, we saw that as appropriate. Doing it for all distribution becomes cost prohibitive just because of the, the amount of distribution that's there and, and how we perceive the risk. Um, so that's the approach that we've taken here, here in Barbados in relation to the undergrounding and added indooring as well, the substation infrastructure. Just to touch on a couple other things from a resilience standpoint, construction standards, Dr. Birdie mentioned, you know, uh, uh, codes and so on for building, which are going to be very critical, being a multifaceted approach, not just the electricity sector. Um, but within the electricity sector as well, these the sort of construction standards we use, whether you're, you know, um, building, building, binding wire, tree wire, space or cable, which reduces the, the, the amount of effort re required after an event um, to restore the system. Vegetation management becomes extremely critical and, and important as well. Um, and looking at you know non-traditional materials for poles, for example, you know some places again a cost-benefit analysis normally goes along with it, but 
you know, you're using composite materials, concrete rather than wood. And uh, again, it will be dependent on the location and, and the risk as perceived by the various planners in the, very, in the territories. I'm on mute, sorry. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Roger. Um, and, and I guess I open up that question um, what, uh, to the other utility members. What is the role of, of, of kind of like, what are some of the exact resilience measures that are being taken for infrastructure, such as undergrounding, like TND, to protect your TND systems? Hi, Martin. Um, so for our um, transmission system, we have both um, underground as well as overhead um, out to our substation. And they, they sort of operate separately and, and back each other. This is, of course, for the, the main island, Provo. Um, so we have about 20 to uh, about twenty to 30 percent of uh, distribution network um, that is underground. Um, and we, we, we did um, rebuild after Hurricane Irma. Um, uh, with a new set of standards, so uh, much stronger to to survive um, hurricanes, um, and this this most largely consisted of shorter spans as well as higher higher class boat. But we use a combination of both underground as well as, as overhead, and that um, seems to have worked for us. Of course, taking into consideration the cost um, factor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Makes sense. Um, Andrew, they actually had a question come in for you specifically, uh, and uh, uh, person asked, you talked about relooking at relooking at the utility model in the Pacific. What are Pacific countries doing in terms of increasing energy reliability, affordability, and sustainability? Yeah, I think for a lot of the Pacific Island, uh, they're looking at. Uh, how to lessen the impact of external external factors on, on the energy security in, in their countries. So in, in that in that sense, there a lot of countries are looking at that uh, you know renewable energy, not only to 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 have energy security but also to to meet the renewable energy uh, to targets in the in the NDCs. So that's that's where a lot of the work is going and. Although uh, I think there's, there's a huge challenge in the Pacific in that a lot of the, the islands, especially the smaller islands, are very much limited in terms of what uh, renewable energy resources they have. It's mainly solar uh, and, and I think even when technology allows, maybe we'll, uh, wave technology or OTEC might come in, but right now it's, it's mostly solar, uh, yeah. But for the bigger, bigger countries in, in the Pacific, they have options of hydro, for example, Fiji, where, where, where I live currently, renewable energy contribution from hydro is about 80, 86%, and looking at the target of 100% by 2030. But then, then there comes the challenge of the cost of getting to that, uh, achieving that renewable energy target. For Fiji itself, uh, for it to achieve the 100% renewable energy target by 2030, it would cost them, it would take uh, an estimated $2.97 billion to achieve it. So that's, that's part of the big challenge facing a lot of the countries in the Pacific in terms of uh, getting to that, uh, to the target that's been set. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we had another question come in, you know, like um, looking at, the collaboration with the utilities and telecommunications. Now, Dr. Burton, you mentioned Canto earlier in your introduction and collaborating when it comes to disaster um, recoveries, but to the panelists, how, how are you planning for, or, or how do you collaborate with um, you know, the ICT service providers to make sure that um, as smart as there's grid modernization and you know internet of things etc uh, do you see greater synergies with those other public utilities um, in the future or as we move forward
Yeah, yeah, Martin. So in, in BVI, um, recognizing our, our particular situation, we have leveraged the, the, the assets which we own, which are mutually used between uh, ourselves and the, um, the various ICTs on island. Um, so we have pool sharing agreements with the with with all we have three ICT um, entities in in the BVI, but in addition to that, we have quite a significant amount of fiber infrastructure um, that we've installed over the um, over the course of, of of a decade and a half, and we also have um, dark fiber uh, lease agreements with those with those entities. So we're seeing where we can actually leverage assets that we have. Uh, for the benefit of the organization and likewise in support of the ICTs with regards to their strategic plans um, going forward. Following the, um, following the hurricanes of 2017, we used the opportunity of um, likewise um, assisting with the rebuilding of the grid naturally in, cer in certain areas. So we've found that there's, um, there's definitely a benefit with regards to ensuring a, 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 a good and cordial and strong relationship exists between the electric utility and the ICTs, and it's, it's worked to the benefit of, of us here locally. I think for the, for the Pacific, that's a conversation that still needs to be had with the, with the relevant partners in, in infrastructure. I think uh, right now in, in the Pacific, we are, we are trying to just take a leave out of uh, Carlec's uh, books and uh, and create uh, our mutual assistance program at the moment. So that's it is a conversation that we know we need to have with other infrastructure providers within the region. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and you speak about you know mutual assistance. We actually had a question come in about about the collaboration with the Caribbean catastrophe. Um, or, uh, risk insurance facility and and funny enough uh, Roger we spoke about about this earlier in the year um, uh, so I guess this this question goes you know Dr. to Roger and Dr. Burden how how important is it to have um, these insurance options or different types of insurance options uh, as a utility given one the disasters that we might face and two some of the innovation that you want to as, as things like energy storage and whatnot, prices come down, you want to protect your assets. So, so could you speak a bit about the role of, of, uh, of special insurance products for utilities? Yeah, yeah, I, I'll speak briefly on it and then turn to, to Dr. Burden, maybe to share a little bit more about CCRIF and some of those initiatives. But just gen generally, as you'd appreciate, the, you know, lots of natural hazards um, that are faced by the islands in, in the region. And access to insurance has been been a challenge. That's an understatement. In fact, you, you can't insure certain assets, and so utilities have had to look at um, you know, new ways of insuring their assets. Um, and in many instances, doing a combination of things. So, where commercial insurance is available, um, utilities will be doing that. Um, so some utilities, like us, have had to set up self-insurance funds. So that's one approach that's been been, been taken. Uh, or has been taken by several utilities. Um, you have initiatives like CCRIF and parametric insurance, another tool more recently that utilities are employing to manage the risks across the portfolio. Uh, and, and so it's, it's really been somewhat of a portfolio approach. Um, what, you know, what risk management tool works best in, in, in which situation, for which category of assets. Um, the, the, the parametric tool and things like CCRIF, maybe I'd, I'd, I'd turn to Dr. Burton to share a little bit more of the experience there and how it's been approached regionally. Yeah, um, thank you, Martin. Thank you, Roger. Yes, well, indeed, the parametric insurance option is something that Carolec has been discussing with uh, CRIF over the last, I would say, 12 to 14 months. Um, uh, I had a conference call with the officials at CRIF just earlier this week, actually, and uh, they have submitted a proposal to their board for an insurance product uh, with elements that would cover, provide coverage for the transmission distribution infrastructure for regional electric utilities who are interested in pursuing that approach. And so they're expecting board approval of that product very shortly. 
uh, hopefully actually uh, Roger and uh, Leroy by board meeting on the 23rd um, <laughs> will be able to announce something. Um, uh, also on that front, uh, um, and since it's just between us six on this call, um, the, the CRIF board has also allocated some millions of, of US dollars towards capitalizing that product. So that will be announced formally shortly. Um, so we have been making a slow but steady progress uh, towards that option. And we are hoping, uh, although we're in the middle of this current hurricane season, definitely by 2021, we would have that option well in place for electric utilities in the region who have an interest in pursuing it. Uh, let me just say that that comes with some commitment uh, to provide uh, data which has to be modeled so that the risk profile for each utility uh, could be uh, assessed and so that the details and parameters of the cover uh, could be assessed and agreed to between the parties directly. Uh, Carolec is simply playing a facilitating role uh, in this activity. So that's where we are at as of now. Well, you, you mentioned uh, data and informatics and, and you know, and, and also we speak about like knowledge exchange and, and I think, I think, you know, for the audience context, uh, there, there's so many levels of data and information that you guys are dealing with uh, every, every, every day to get the business to go forward. Um, what, what type of uh, tools could be beneficial um, for, for utilities uh, of the future, um, given, given the pace at which innovation is happening um, in technology? I, 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 sorry, I should reframe that. Like, like what, what, like, how, how much does, does the role of um, new software and technology play in helping with the data informatics? How has it evolved for you? Uh, and how can it play, assist with resiliency planning? Um, I'll, I'll direct, I'll direct this one um, at uh, Roger. <laughs> um, the, so, so, you know, we, we, we hear the, the term big data, um, you know, in recent times uh, has come up as, you know, we, we've entered the digital age and um, certainly as, as all businesses and the utilities, no exception, um, has transformed you have a lot more information and data now that needs to be managed. So I, I mentioned earlier, for example, or EMA, or Advanced Metering Infrastructure Project, um, which uh, is about over 80% complete. We should be done by the end of this year. Um, and gone are the days where you would have read a meter every other month for your residential customers and send interim bills, which is always a little bit of a, a challenge or a bugbear for some of our customers where you're estimating bills. Now you essentially have real time um, or near real-time information on uh, customer consumption and no longer need to, to, to estimate bills. Um, and um, so there are a lot of benefits that come with technology, but there's that paradox as well. Now with all of, the, all of that technology that's available, um, there are new challenges that you need to manage. And, and one is how do you deal with, with all this data that is coming in? And so we have been, um, you know, and not, no different than the other utilities, I'm sure, um, employing and installing new systems to manage that data and to be able to, to create intelligence from the data that's there. Um, so capturing the data, for example, from our metering system and using it to analyze um, patterns, or better estimate cost of service, for example, uh, provide a better um, level of service to customers in terms of real-time response. Um, the ability to um, have outage management systems so you can use the information from the meters now in the real time communication that exists um, to no longer have to need, rely on customers calling in to report an outage because you know, as that infrastructure grows and that um, network grows, you, you can see in real time when those events occur and you can provide customers with that information in real time by your portals online and so on. Um, so, there are a lot of benefits that have been derived from you know, the digitalization of systems.
but a lot of challenges uh, uh, have come with it. And the way certainly we have approached it is, you know, installing and, and commissioning new systems that allow us to manage that big data in an efficient way. One thing maybe before uh, defer to some of the others would be, as we speak about resilience, uh, another element of the paradox is that cybersecurity is, is, and we haven't touched on that yet, becomes a big, um, a, a new aspect of resilience that we need to think about. And again, that's, uh, you know, along with all the benefits, you now have a, a new challenge to deal with. And I know that's occupying everyone on this call uh, a lot of their attention and time, I'm sure. Thanks, Morgan. Yeah, that, that's such a great point um, that it becomes an issue of not, not just cyber, national security. Um, and the utilities play a great role in, in navigating that. So information, so the more integration of information uh, can help the process of building resilience, but we also have to protect the process of building resilience. Uh, and, you know, we, we are, we're always hearing of these technologies that are on the grid edge. So we, we, we have electric vehicles coming on board and we have energy storage. Um, what role do you see your utilities playing um, or what role do you see these technologies playing or affecting your, your approach to, to, to resilience? I know we've, we've taken quite a lead um, on tackling all aspects just by the nature of being islands. So what role uh, do you see energy storage and preparing for electric mobility? Yeah, I, I could maybe start the ball rolling on this one. We, we have quite um, a, a large number in our context, the island context of electric vehicles um, on, on the island, somewhere in the order of maybe 450, 500. And we recently, the government has, has brought in, uh, I think it's 18 electric buses as well. So we're foraying to um, electric public transportation has started over the last month here. Um, and so the, the electric, you know, electrification and the infrastructure, that's something that as a utility, we, we all need to pay and are paying keen attention to. And because um, while we all welcome the growth that that brings and the new kilowatt hour sales that, that come with electrification, um, again, the paradox is it comes with some challenges and you need to keep, as that sector grows and you, you start to get significant penetration of EVs, the way those vehicles are charged and when they're charged become a critical concern for the utility because um, if not managed carefully, you could end up with you know, poor load factors, you know, very peaky and, and, and lots of valleys in your, your demand, which is not efficient from a cost standpoint. And so I think a lot of the utilities um, have been thinking about that, um, looking at things like smart chargers, integrating that on the communication infrastructure that um, supports the meters now so that you can have visibility and sight of the charging and some influence on it as well. Time of use rates become important because as far as possible, you want to encourage the charging uh, at times where it is most cost effective for everyone on, on the network. And it becomes a resource as well for the grid in terms of managing um, overloads, for example. Um, it, you know, it's an interruptible load that doesn't create a lot of inconvenience. Uh, and so demand response opportunities through using that storage that is in the EVs, um, all networked and aggregated. Uh, and vehicle to grid, for example, it, or, or is something that's being looked at. And so as you talked about or asked about storage, um, you know, clearly the, the, the vehicles are storage on wheels and there's a role to play there and how you integrate that. And then storage generally in the home is part of microgrid establishment and, uh, and management uh, similarly need to be looked at um, carefully. So, so, so just adding to what Roger um, stated, um, battery energy storage systems certainly will play a significant role in the future to the, the uh, future utility. Um, most of us, if we haven't already, already have battery energy storage systems installed at, at, the, at the various utilities are in the infancy of exploring that. For, for BVIEC, we just recently, two months ago, awarded a contract. We have one island which, is, which isn't connected to the parent grid, and we just um, awarded a contract to a company to install a 2.2 megawatt RE and battery energy and best system on this one particular island. We're also in the infancy of looking at um, opportunities on the parent grid 
where we can introduce um, um, battery storage as well to assist and support the renewables that we anticipate we're going to add to the grid. So the, the utility of the future, definitely um, best systems will be playing a very key and critical role um, going forward with regards to the future utility, in, in my personal opinion. I think in, in, uh, sorry, go ahead. Hi, hi Martin. Just as um, far said, um, we see the electrification of transportation as another year of opportunity for us as well. Um, we, we have um, a pilot um, program on the go um, to essentially build the ecosystem um, around um, the electrification industry. Um, and we, we've also um, looking at this from a partnership standpoint, we've, we've partnered with, with the, the local um, car rental companies as well as the hotels um, to um, assist with the uptake and, and, and um, electric vehicle fleet. So also, you know, from a partnership standpoint and co a collaborative standpoint, um, we're looking at this as well. Um, we also have a, um, a, a pilot project, not as advanced as some of the, the other utilities, but we, we are also looking at solar plus battery initiatives. Um, and that's also in our pipeline. Yeah, Martin, yeah. Uh, I think in, in, in the Pacific, uh, we, we see uh, EV electric vehicles as an opportunity to, to to increase our storage capacity for the island island grids, and also in in, in doing so, you know, uh, to increase the level of penetration of renewable energy, especially where a lot of the island systems have to curtail the output because uh, the system cannot ab absorb it. But uh, we note that uh, there needs to be some work done in in terms of the of the policies for electric vehicles. And that's something that most of the island governments have to have to put in place first before we can really uh, uh, work on, on, on uh, a program to, to, to expand the current uh, or to in increase the current number of electric vehicles on the island. Some of the utilities have uh, started doing it, but on a very small scale, considering the cost of the cost of the vehicles themselves, the, the after sales uh, service of the vehicles that can be quite difficult in the, in the islands. We, most of them might have the expertise to service the vehicles. And so that, that needs to be in place first, I think. And we look at this as an opportunity for private sector participation in this, in this particular space in, in the Pacific. Um, your mic is still muted, Martin. Sorry, I have two mics. Um, <laughs> have the safety. <laughs> yeah. So, so thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Ruth, and and everyone. Um, my my question now is kind of like looking towards the future. Uh, we, because you know, we've talked about the importance of partnerships, but there's also the the importance of partnerships with educational um, um, institutions. Uh, because as, as, as we face this new innovation, we wanna see more uh, women and men getting involved in, in the electricity space. And how, can, how do you foresee the utilities role in, in kind of guiding that research and development space or collaborating and impacting a greater awareness so that we, we have the capacity in, in place um, regionally? And, I'll open this up uh, I, to, to I'll, I'll start with Dr. Burden and then uh, go around. <laughs> right. Um, thank you, Martin. That's a really good, great question. I mean, our prospects for the future really lies in our capacity to innovate, um, to conduct relevant research and adapt technologies that are relevant to the region in our context. And so, one of the more exciting things that we are happy to be collaborating with is with the CARICOM initiative under the TAPSEC project um, called RUN, which is a regional universities network. So efforts are being made there to, again, uh, not wanting to, to overstate the case of collaboration and synergies, 
the regional universities network is seeking to do just that uh, pool expertise from across the region in terms of innovation research and development and hopefully have breakthroughs and technologies that could be uniquely applied to our context And, and for any of the other utilities, are, are there, do you collaborate a lot with, um, to usher in more uh, women and men into this space? So, so yes, Martin, and very excellent question. What we've, what the realization that we've come to is that this industry, the, the level of transformation that we want to see isn't going to be realized until we have the, the relevant capacity building and we essentially um, either retool or reskill individuals in the industry, particularly at this partic at, particularly at this time when we have so many people who are unemployed um, due to the, the, the disruption of their particular um, um, industry that they work in as a result of the, as a result of the pandemic. Um, we recently collaborated with a local community college who's about um, to put on a certified solar technician program. Um, unfortunately, it has suffered some delays as a result of the pandemic and the various curfew orders and, 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 and shutdowns as a result of the pandemic. But we see that as um, key and critical to the actual um, development of this new um, industry, renewable energy industry, by being able to have the relevant capacity on the ground to, to really push this, this renewable energy transformation for the BVI forward. In the absence of it, it's going to be very difficult as we've seen um, because we've had a legal framework to support renewable energy um, integration on a distributive level. But um, recognizing the very small um, to almost non-existent number of practitioners that we have on the island, we haven't seen a very significant trust like what we would like to see eventually that what has taken place in Barbados, for instance. So it's, it's, it's key and critical to, to getting the industry going. And that's why we've been very supportive and collaborating with the college with regards to this program that they're about to, to host. Hi, hi Martin. Um, for us, um, this is also a, a critical point. Um, for us, we've had challenges with um, sourcing um, resources as everyone else has. Um, um, we have been um, to an extent um, developing from within as well, um, building our capacity from within. Um, and we also partner with, with um, the local institutions as well um, to um, you know, in, at least introduce the idea um, to, um, to students and um, also offer um, scholarship programs to students as well. Um, uh, on the technical aspect of it. So um, we, see, we also see collaboration with, with the local institution as, a, as, a, as, a, as something that has worked for us. Thank you very much. Um, and Andrew, in the, in the Pacific, there, there, there's, there's, I remember a while back there was a program for training in, I believe, photovoltaics, um, but uh, I, you, you guys as well have these collaborations with, with tertiary level education? Yes, we do with the University of South Pacific. We work closely with them in terms of uh, training with the training in the renewable energy sector. And all, not only that, but also in, in with other, another industry-based organization that works mostly, uh, or that derives mo its membership mostly from from the private entities that actually work uh, doing installations and operation maintenance of uh, renewable energy systems. So we, we work closely with them to, 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 to uh, facilitate uh, training for, for, the, for the renewable energy industry in the, in the Pacific. Well, um, I know we have uh, just a few more minutes left. Uh, any closing statements as, uh, from, from, from you all? Uh, anything that you'd like to share in terms of your hope for the future? Are, are, you, are you hopeful um, for, for, I know that's a, a, a soft but a powerful question, right? Like I think, you know, thanks to James for this, this conference and this platform in addition 
to the various uh, opportunities we have to network. But, but I think, you know, what, what is your, your outlook for the future um, moving forward? Kind of your um, mantra. <laughs> I, I, I just, I, I'll just go around quickly and uh, I'll, I'll start from the top of my screen. I'll go Roger and, and come right around before we close. Thanks, Martin. Yeah, cer certainly hopeful. I'm, I am optimistic. I mean, we, we are seeing the transition taking place. Uh, it needs to be managed carefully and phased, as I mentioned earlier, and some key things that need to happen to enable um, successful transition. Um, but uh, a, a big part of it is stakeholder consultation. I know all on the call are, are doing that in their various territories and, and um, you know, regional and, and, and global, I guess, collaboration as well. And, so like what we're doing here and sharing information, sharing ideas, collaborating where, where it makes sense to, to do so. So I am, I am optimistic um, about the, the future. Uh, and setting, you know, um, as you mentioned, our goals here on the island are quite ambitious. Um, and there are debates about timing and cost um, and what, what is appropriate in terms of, uh, as a, of the time. Is the 2030 too ambitious, too costly? I'm sure it'd be a longer time period. Um, but those are good debates to be having, right? I mean, so it, it isn't about uh, whether it will happen, it's about when and how we will go about doing it. Uh, and I think that is important that we, we continue to have those discussions and we challenge each other as stakeholders um, because the transition is going to be important um, for us going forward. Thanks. And uh, I, I, see, I see Ruth here next on my screen. So uh, what? Hi, hi, Martin. Um, definitely hopeful. Um, there, despite the the challenges, there there are significant opportunities ahead for us. Um, we um, the trends, you know, just capitalizing on 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 the treaties. Um, one of the things that um, that that one of the pain points for us has been um, um, the regulation. So definitely. Um, collaborating with, with um, the regulators to ensure that um, the, the appropriate um, regulations are in place to, to ensure that utilities are able to thrive um, within those three Ds. So um, there's definitely a lot on the horizon. Resiliency and sustain, sustainability um, is um, high on our priority for the future. Um, we do have a, a, a goal of 30% um, renewable energy by 2040. Um, and that, that is expected um, um, in order for us to achieve that collaboration would, would definitely be um, necessary. So very hopeful. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and thank you. And, and Leroy, thanks. I know you have, have some insights. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so, so, Martin, no pun intended. I, I'm going to speak for the entire region and say um, the future is 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 very bright for the entire Caribbean region. Um, albeit, as Ruth indicated, the circumstances that we're all um, grappling with at this particular time, I think it gives us the opportunity to look very positively to 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 essentially reset. Um, it's, it's a period of reset for for all of us. Um, to look at the opportunities which can be gained from this particular situation. Um, all of us are in various stages with regards to our individual transformations, incorporating um, more renewables. All of us have various targets for BVI. Um, the government administration has indicated they want us to be um, at least 30% by, by 2030. Um, we feel very confident that we would be able to to achieve that based on all the various initiatives that we currently have in the in the in the pipeline, um, and it's I think it's an exciting time for the for the region as we see, as I say, just not one jurisdiction but the majority of of the entire Caribbean um, going through this transformation. Some of us are a lot more advanced than others. Uh, but certainly we can use the best practices and lessons, lessons learned of the ones who went before us um, to essentially assist and support the ones who are trailing. So as I say, I, I, I'm very optimistic and, and, and feel, very, feel very happy with regards to what I'm seeing in regional. Thank you, Leroy. And I know we're, we're coming up at 9.30, but I really wanted to hear last, last words from Andrew and then Dr. Burton, just as the heads of the regional bodies 
Uh, thank you, Martin. I think, uh, like the other panelists, I've got to be optimistic about uh, where we're heading. I think it, it will take a lot of effort and uh, a joint effort for that matter, involving governments, policymakers, regulators, and the utilities uh, to, to get to where we, are, we want to be in terms of our renewable energy targets and getting uh, resilience in place. But uh, I think we've, we've, we've started and, and it's, it, it, it is a, a thing, it's going to take some time because of the, the, the challenges we have. Mm-hmm. But I think having said that, um, technology will, will be the least of our challenges, I think. Technology will, will overcome, uh, we will overcome technological challenges over time. It's more to do with the policies, regulations, and that, that we need to have in place so that we can ensure there's a, a a clear path forward for us in terms of moving to where we want to be. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, Vinaka, (laughs) thank you. (laughs) (laughs) And Dr. Burton, um, I'll leave it to you to just share some last words on behalf of Carolec. Well, yeah, just just a few thoughts that, um, just to say that Carolec as a regional association is really nothing without its membership. And I'm, I cannot help but share the optimism of this panel, especially as it comprises uh, some of the forerunners in the association. So let me take this opportunity to thank them for the support. Uh, Barbados Light and Power, Fortis TCI, uh, BVIEC, uh, Roger Roof and Leroy. Um, thank you for your support and that of your utility. And we really look forward to uh, deepening the collaboration within the association and as we said, continually collaborating across sectors and using an evidence-based approach to formulate policy and reform and transition in the sector. I think we can be really optimistic about the future. Thanks. Well, panelists, you guys stay safe. Thank you for waking up early and staying up late. (laughs) And James, you know, thank you for inviting myself and and our group here to be a part of this conference. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All the best. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank, you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, Please bye. stay safe. All the best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Bye.